Hi, I'm Amar Guri, world builder and narrative designer extraordinaire, and I produced a punk opera in Conlang for my fantasy world. More specifically, I produced a counterculture common opera. It's not punk like the music genre. It's punk like the nonconformist counterculture movement. And、uh, this was all to celebrate the second annual Isaya Week, where I release Isaya-themed videos every day of the week.、Uh, this year, it's all about Semenium Girls and their debut opera of the same name. So let's walk you through how we developed this project. See, the dominant culture in After Cartoria of my world is Svanic culture.、Uh, Svanic culture, highly guided by the Church of Deus, is known for its focus on community and de-emphasis on familial and romantic bonds being special. Also, with a focus on interconnectedness with the world at large. But recently, this has come to mean that this culture will try to take over other cultures to interconnect with them better, and thus a counterculture that's anti-imperialism. Anti-church and politics, and pro-marriage and nuclear family,、uh, has emerged to counter the predominant cultural narrative. I honestly don't know if we have an analog to either of these cultures in or subcultures in our real world. I mean, not like a one-to-one.、Um, so yeah, that's what punk looks like in my fantasy world.、Uh, and by the way, if you haven't thought about what punk is in your fantasy world, like what's the dominant in,、uh, subcultures of your world,、uh, you should definitely think about that. But yeah, let's uh let's get on to the opera part of this Conlang opera. This whole project started because of Yunjin's opera from Genshin Impact. For those of you who don't know, Genshin Impact is an open world pastoral fantasy RPG from Chinese developer Polyoverse. No, this is not sponsored. But God, I wish it was. Alas. Anyway, so I know a non-zero number of people are gonna cringe because I'm a Genshin player, but as an adopted Chinese girl,、uh, nothing has gotten me more interested in understanding my birth culture than this game, and most specifically this opera. Very minor spoilers, but Yunjin is that world, the Genshin Impact world's equivalent of a Chinese opera singer, and she goes to this small village、uh, to research her opera, where a tragedy once stuck, struck and a demon attacked. To save the village,、uh, this a small girl volunteered to be sacrificed to the demon. But she defeated the demon in a sword fight instead. However, due to her change in the struggle, she could never live among humans again because she was too too changed by the fight. So she went to go live with the minor gods of the region. And、uh, so Yunjin, once she gets to this village, meets the actual girl from the story who tells it a different way. And so she modifies her opera to include more of the truth. And then she and the girl go on to save the world for real, and it's just so beautiful. I cry every time I hear it. it. I mean, it's about a girl who is taken from her home, and then she finds new friends. Like that's just the quintessential happy adoption story. So I, I find it very relatable. So what does this have to do with me aside from the fact that I like it? This is the setup for the deliverable for the final thing of this project. It's a video game esque opera. I.e., a short piece of in-fiction musical theater that hypothetically represents a larger, full three-hour piece, like the play in Final Fantasy IX or the opera in Undertale.、Uh, but obviously, Yunjin was singing a modern take on a Chinese opera. So, what does music sound like in Isaya?、Uh, let alone punk music. Firstly, we have my dear friend Eric to thank for designing the musical soundscape of Isaya. If any of you were around last year, you know I commissioned him to create musical snippets for all the different cultures in my world. Well, Sphonic has this focus on improvisation, improvisation and circularity to reflect the winding of life.、Uh, and you know what real life musical style does this? His Hindustani and Carnatic music. I've actually slowly been incorporating some more Indian and Southeast Asian aesthetics. Into and cultural elements into Sphonic culture,、uh, mostly regarding how they tack- tackle the climate they live in.、Uh, but like I've mentioned already, Sphonic culture doesn't really have a good one-to-one、uh, parallel to any Earth culture.、Uh, it also has elements of pre-Russian Slavic culture and Mongols from the 1200s, and it takes. 
but it takes its visual cues from hotter cultures in tropical areas. Uh, that's cultures from hotter areas. The culture isn't hot. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm not trying to sexualize people's culture. But yeah, uh, the next thing to understand about Sphonic culture is people are pretty spiritual and they don't like things that have to do with the abyss and Ys, the magical particle in my world. They're very wary of it, especially music made on instruments, which are east based music uh, instruments. And so punk music, or the devil's music, is probably made with more of these synthetic sounds. And in my video game, The Little Burned Maiden, the assassin life sim about murder and self-care, I made East Particles make sounds like chimes. Though recently I've come to think that maybe East would make more of a buzzing sound, I'm still not conv convinced. But basically it lets you make synth noises. Now despite dipping my toes in musical composition, I don't feel confident in my skills to make this myself. Yikes. So I reached out to Ricardo from Riggs Productions, or Riggs Z Productions, on Fiverr to compose the backtrack for me. I laid out this whole project to them, and, well, here's my reaction to hearing it for the first time. Oh! Oh no! Wow! Oh my god, that was amazing! Oh, that's exactly the emotion I was going for. Oh my god, I am so impressed. So yeah, it's pretty good. With the backtrack in place, now I need to translate it. Now, Sphonic has gone through two iterations. I made so many mistakes with the first lexicon. My words literally broke all of the rules that I set that I had made myself, and I, so I just started over at some point. So my conlang showcase here on YouTube is actually one of my most watched videos of right near my uh, linguistics video, so I, it's, there's a big chance that you might have seen it. Uh, but as a brief overview, it's designed to sound flowy and warm, uh, and have four different layers of formality and conjugations based on if something's animate or not. Uh, it's a whole actual little toy lang. This opera isn't just nonsense sounds, so you could de decode it for yourself, hypothetically. Uh, now when I write conlang songs, I don't write the English poetically, I write a general vibe of what I want. After all, it's supposed to be originally written in this fictional language, right? I mostly focus on the vibe when I'm in English, and then I translate it into Sphonic as focusing on the poeticism in Sphonic, not in English. Uh, so when you translate it literally back into English, then it's usually kind of weird, actually, because as you know, when you translate something literally, it will lose its poeticism. So yeah, you can, you'll get to see on the final day what all of the translations are. So now, with the music written in theory, it comes down to the performance. And for a performance, we need performers. Except I don't just need real performers, I also need to know the fictional performers who performed this in my world and who wrote it in the context of my world. So, of course, I watch all of Crass Course history mm, to learn the bare bones basics about theater and cultures throughout time. Uh, <laughs> and then I sketch out all the specific members of my counterculture opera troupe. We have Kina Varis, Kina for short, the lead singer, uh, Tirnavia, the cutesy but particular dancer, and lastly, I didn't draw him out back then, but I had imagined him like this, this is Chetiel. And then for anyone following my writing, you'll know that uh, Chetiel is the twin brother of Zalathiel, the Inquisitor General. And though hilariously, hilariously Chetiel's design came first, even though I didn't draw him back in the day. So yeah, uh, I made those like a year or two, so I dusted them off and touched them up for this performance, and made them their little visual novel sprites. Whoops, late night fall here, uh, editing bell. Uh, somehow in the original edit of this video, I forgot to tell you what the opera is actually about. Okay, so first I outlined how the fairy tale would go in my world. It goes, Once upon a time, there lived a stonemason in a little village by the sea. One day, she met and fell in love with the seeress, Yulia, the daughter of God. Soon, war broke out in somewhere to the east, and Yulia was called away to fight in the battle. Yulia left the stonemason to serve her duty. Though the stonemason was very sorrowful, she did her best to learn and grow herself apart from Yulia. However, a terrible flood came to their little city. Thankfully, Yulia foresaw this and returned just in time to evacuate everyone and save the stonemason. 
With the war and the flood overcome, Yulia settled down to live peacefully with a stonemason for the rest of her life. Basically, the moral of the story is trust in God and everything will be alright. <laughs> so I turned that into a musical outline for Semenium Girls. If you don't know, all good musicals have similar songs to make the plot go forward, such as the opening number, this sets the scene for the rest of the performance. Uh, imagine the opening to Disney's Beauty and the Beast or Hamilton, that's the vibe. Next, the I Want song. This is typically used for the protagonists who want something to change in their lives. Then, there's the I Am song. This is typically used by villains to declare what they are and why they won't change. The Crisis song is exactly what it sounds like. Bad things are happening. I like them best when they're a battle duet and you're singing while you fight. Like Jean Valjean and Javert singing on the bridge? I actually don't know where the setting is supposed to be for that scene. <laughs> okay, and then, then there's the dance only song. This is used when your emotions get too big, and so you just have to dance out your emotions instead. And lastly, the finale, or the showstopper at the end of the show. This is to convince you to buy another ticket. So, in the hypothetical full version of Semenium Girls, we have the opening song, Village by the Sea, here we're introduced to the titular stonemason, a widowed outcast who once got married even though it's illegal, and she sings about how there's a little place for everyone else in her little village by the sea, as long as you want to leave to join the military and you don't anyone love anyone more than you love the law. There's a place for everyone in our little village by the sea. Um, the I Want song is so many of girls. This is where the stonemason meets the Cirrus, and the Cirrus is running away from the military who's demanding her guidance. Meanwhile, the stonemason wants to find love and community again, and they fall in love. But then, there's the I Am song, for the foundation. The head of the military makes an offer to the series to have her return to them, by declaring how strong and how important it is to subjugate their foes, as well as spread the ideals of the state. This evil song demonstrates what Kinovaris hates about the state right now. Then the crisis song battle duet, Who Am I? The stonemason and the Cirrus will be separated by the demands of their people. The Cirrus will go off to war because she sees a random injured person die and thinks of the stonemason and how she doesn't want her to die like that. And the stonemason becomes more respected for her stonemasonry and her proximity to power. Who am I to refuse my call and mantle and let you die like any other man? Who am I to demand in my selfishness your love and attention and for you to stay? They sing at each other. Next, there's the climax. It's a dance only where there's a flood in the city, and the stonemason tries to work with the villagers to stop it, but they can't. And the Cirrus returns and helps to save everyone, even though the village is washed away, Zavlakia, the people, are saved. And the finale of the song, Semenium Heart, the Cirrus rejects the military offer and decides to be with the stonemason to guide her and her people to build a better community, rather than fighting a war to spread colonization to people who already have their own ways. So in writing the not full-length offer you'll hear at the end of the week, I threw in some of the titles of these songs as potential lyrics as well as the like sample lyrics I wrote. Uh, sidebar, in my dumb brain I noticed that some many of the material have similar syllable counts so you could put it in the, the Material Girl song and be like, Cause I am a Semenium girl and I'm living in a Semenium world. <laughs> so anyways, if anyone knows how to make parody covers without legal fights, let me know. Teach me to do it for real. I'll do it. <laughs> oh. Figuring out the visuals for this opera was an actual pain. Like, I really didn't know what to do. I considered doing an animatic, like what I did for Eberron a few years back, but I'm sure I couldn't make it look... I mean, animation is so hard. I hate doing animation. I'm sure I could make it look better than that. I have so much respect for animators, but dang, I just, I can't do... I can't, I can't stand it. So I just said no. I don't want to sink another thousand dollars into a VTuber. If you don't know, this is, that's the model I control. Um, because this, okay, this was about, um... 1.5 thousand USD. VTuber models cost a lot. Absolutely worth it. You should pay artists what they're worth. The rigging is where, like, the price really gets you. But I didn't have the money to do that this year for this one-off thing. But her parents was still really important to me. I had this really specific image for Kina's body, because it's not just the busty, typical anime girl body type in my head. Uh, I tried out some pre-made 3D things, uh, but I didn't really like them. 
Uh, I considered a couple of different pre-made live 2D models, but it was really hard to find characters with long flowy hair in a white dress that didn't immediately read as modern, and also a character having a flat chest. Um, I even considered rigging my own model at one point, but between my job and my other hobbies, there's just no time for me to learn that. So I finally settled on this model for her. It's not perfect, but we'll just say she's really good at makeup and stuffing her bra. <laughs> and so at the same time, I had to find a good voice for Kina. So I reached out to one of my friends, Swan, who I know sings as a hobby, and told them what I wanted them to be doing, and they were on board. Hey y'all, my name is Swan, and I'm the voice of Kina Vars. I design games for a living, and I also practice voice acting and singing, among a variety of other things when I have time. In particular, I play a lot of TTRPGs and research how identity affects the way people play, and vice versa. I was very excited when Belle reached out to me about this project, and enjoyed the opportunity to both learn more about her world and contribute to it. As someone who is gender fluid, I have found my voice to be a powerful way to express myself, and bringing characters like Kina to life is one of my favorite ways to go about that. Thank you for having me, and if you want to get in touch or read poetry that I write daily, you can find me on Tumblr as the Swan Dragon. Bell has hopefully put a link in the description as well. Thanks again, and I hope you enjoy the opera. I also relied a lot on my partner Emers, who had a lot of theater experience growing up, and Rose from the Dragon's Rose, who actually studied theater in LA. And of course, I drew on my own experience from doing Shakespeare growing up, and my love of East Asian pop music and the culture surrounding that, and I took snippets from all these experiences, and my love of the entertainment industry, and, you know, everything from the beauty to the exploitation, and I put it all into this week of opera. Oh, and, oh, and I also credit to Raw Ice, also from the Moron Games channel here on YouTube. He is an incredible community member. He's composed like 20 songs for Issei at this point, just like for free. It's amazing. Um, but Raw Ice did some mixing and mastering for me. Music guy knows a lot more about everything. So with the world building and writing and music and performers under my belt, now it's just time to just bring it all together. You know, because it's easy to effortlessly simulate a breakout masterpiece of theater performance. <laughs> I started this two years ago and worked on it in earnest for about the last three months here. It's not perfect, but I think for this Issei week, we've put together something really special. So, let's set your expectations for Semenium Girls. First, you'll get to know the Semenium Girls and their producer. Then, you'll get to learn both about theater and the entertainment industry, how it's both evolved in my world and in the real world. And that way, you can imagine your own entertainment industry in your writing or world building or perhaps your D&D campaign. Uh, you'll learn the in-world story about the development of Semenium Girls, how did these actors and performers come to write and believe the things that they do. And finally, on the 21st, the Semenium Girls will put on their debut performance of Semenium Girls. If you can't wait, then you'll have to tide yourself over with my other Isaiah-themed world building videos until then. <laughs>